Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running talk show on computers and technology. Thank you so much for joining us. And, well, we have a great show lineup for you today because it is our all Linux program. And, of course, we have Cooking with Linux, Marcel Gagne, free thinker at large, man of a thousand titles. I don't know which one to use. And it's going to be a lot of fun as we, you know, have a bunch of Linux topics. And for anyone out there who may be new, uh, to the whole idea of Linux on a computer show. Freaky, I know, but we're going to get through it together. And, you know, we like to devote at least one show every single month, really. I was about to say day, but one show every single month, uh, at least, to the operating system because, you know, there is a user base out there. There are people out there, and we feel that the more people hear about Linux, the more people understand the core tenets of what makes Linux such a great operating system, well, the better chance that you're probably going to, you know, go out, get your own distribution, you know, get into Linux yourself. And it's a lot of fun and there's a lot out there. So, of course, helping us with that is Marcel Gagne. He is very, very prolific in the community. And, of course, you can check him out. We have links in the show notes. And, of course, speaking of show notes, head on over to ComputerAmerica.com where you'll find today's show notes, all day show notes, as well as video archives, uh, audio archives, podcasts, um, you know, all that kind of thing, as well as a contest that we will be announcing a winner for tomorrow and a live video stream so that you can watch Computer America and not just listen. And I think all of that out of the way, why don't we just bring on our guests? And again, Marcel Gagné, Cooking with Linux. Why don't you uh, say hi to everyone? Because I hear you in the background. Hey, hi. Yes, I'm in the background. Actually, I was. I. I, I just. You know, I was trying to. I, I got was, you. I got you. I was trying to click quietly. Okay. <laughs> you know, got my little mouse going across. You know, and I'm trying to click quietly. And of course, it's like, can they hear the mouse clicking on this? Of you know, course we can. But it's a computer show, so it's okay. So, <laughs> welcome, Marcel. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. How are you doing, dude? Doing, you know, just finds a good word. Just fine it, it, is a feel, good it word. Feels like, it feels like an amazingly long time uh, between conversations. <clears throat> it it really does, and yes, but, so much so that every time you call me, it's like, oh, <laughs> hi. Didn't we? Weren't we just talking? Like, you know, it was either a long, long time ago, or it's just yesterday. I can never remember which one it is. Right, but hopefully I, that I means my children. I blame my children who don't let me sleep. <laughs> See, you you can do that, but I don't have kids, so what do I blame? <laughs> What's your excuse? You're staying up late playing video games, I'm sure. What are wow. you playing these days, dude? You, what's, you, what's your, you, what's your you console me, addiction? You know me too well. Um, Actually, I, I've been, uh, and for everyone out there, I've mentioned it like once or twice on the show, but uh, Computer America, we are getting our Twitch account up and running, and we are trying to stream on Twitch about four hours every night, if we can, and we play computer games. We play uh, Overwatch, League of Legends, um... Uh, I said Overwatch, League of Legends, Heroes, Heroes of the Storm. I mean, you know, just kind of popular computer games. And of course, you know, you know what's hmm? crazy? Those are that, that's none of the games I play. <laughs> what uh, it? I, I mean, uh, I, as I understood, you were trying to get into the streaming thing as well. I mean, it's uh, it's a tough nut to crack, but it's a lot of fun at the same time. What you know, uh, you know, what are you up to? I, well, I have to say that it's it's not. Um, you know, I. I do an awful lot. One of the things I, I do uh, that I've I've listed more than once, and you know I've got a little Flipboard magazine that I call "Look a Shiny Object." That's because I get distracted by things constantly. So so not only am I doing you know on YouTube I do the cooking with Linux videos, but I also do Android game videos because you know I, I frankly I like to game on Android. I, I like the fact that I can just pick up my phone or my tablet wherever I am and, uh, you know, and, and get into a game. If I've got a few minutes to kill or something, I, I can, I can play some kind of game. Now, um, 
console games are definitely cool as well. Did I tell you about going to a, a, I, I don't know if this happened before or after our last conversation, but I actually went to a virtual reality arcade. No, you have not mentioned that. Okay, I have to tell you this because it was freaking awesome. <laughs> it, it was really awesome. Uh, and I, hang on, I'm gonna have a sip of my uh, my sure. Cabernet Sauvignon sure. here. Sure. And, and, and I mean, just real quick, I mean that that idea is the exact thing that we have talked to. Uh, you know, so many experts in VR, so many people who want VR to proliferate. That is the exact thing that people you know kind of need. It's the ability to go and put these things on themselves. There is around here. Uh, there's a few of them scattered across the country. I, I can't speak for what's in, uh, you know, in your neighborhood there. But uh, here in Waterloo, where I live, there is a place called Control V, as in, you know, paste. Right. <laughs> Control V, C T R L hyphen V. Um, Anyway, uh, and they're opening up locations like across the country. They've got uh, – when I went, they had three locations, and I chatted with the people up there, and they're opening up like a couple dozen more across the country. These, What you've got is you've got like this big place, which has a whole bunch of eight by eight roughly, eight feet by eight feet roughly cubicles where you stand inside, you put on an HTC Vive head, headset, okay, mm -hmm. and they've got like, you know – ten thousand dollars of bloody computer equipment you know uh powering up each one of these um you know individual little rooms right and i went there with my son my son my nine-year-old son i went in there with him and uh he sat in the booth next to me and i sat on the other side we both put on our headsets you know um you know with the headphones and you're holding the controllers in your hands and i have to say it was one of the most amazing experiences i've ever had <laughs> First of all, you get to move freely inside this area, and there is like there there are virtual walls that sort of appear to let you know that you're stepping outside the boundaries. Right. But once you put this thing on, uh, the the Vive have, headsets are so good that you don't get any of this weird motion sickness stuff that you get, you know, from some of the cheaper sets. That's thing number one. We played three games while we were there. One of them is a dodgeball game where you you pick up these glowing balls and you fire at computer generated opponents, mm -hmm. um, or you can fire at other teams as well. But my son and I played on one team and we played against uh, these computer generated, uh, you know, opponents. And you are like literally wandering around this landscape, you know, teleporting from location to location, firing at these things. And, and um, you know, you're inside this, you know, cartoonish sort of body. But the games that really struck me, that really, really got me, one right. of them was like Galaga. You remember, you know the game Galaga where you've got yeah. the... Yeah, uh, the spaceships and the bugs and the weird yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was kind of like that, except, of course, that they're three-dimensional and coming toward you. You are dressed up inside basically this funky 1950s space suit, you know, with the bubble space suit like yeah. they thought we were going to have in the future. Anyway, and you've got these cool guns that you fire. You've got guns in each hand, and you're firing at these things and so forth. And when they, if, if they get you, and, of course, you have to dodge them and so forth while you try to blast them, and they're spinning around like in Galaga. So they're coming around these waves, these swarms coming toward you. And if you turn to the person next to you, in this case my son, mm -hmm. you can actually see him standing next to you inside his suit. Okay? That's cool. So he's standing next to me, and then of course, at some point, you 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 can't win. So at some point, you wind up get you wind up losing. Okay, right. And while the game is resetting, there's this brief moment where you don't have the guns in your hand. So you're just standing there in your suit, waiting for the game to reset. And you turn to each other, and this is like this is one of those freaky things. There are two freaky situations I have to describe here. So I sit there and I give him a fist pump. Yeah. Okay. In VR, and you can feel the fist pump. That's that's cool. Okay, as you know, as you tap each other's gloves in space, of course, you're not actually touching because he's haptic in haptic feedback, right? Haptic okay. feedback. Well, let's let let, let me let me uh, let, you hold on to that thought for a sure. second, okay? Sure. Okay. Next game we played was something called Quiver, okay, which is kind of this weird, um, you know, uh, 
uh, Lord of the Rings sort of thing, where you've got orcs and you know and you know and mythical sort of warriors coming toward your castle, and you have to defend the castle gates. And you're a warrior with a quiver of arrows at your side, and every once in a while you can pull magic arrows out of anything. But you reach down, you grab an arrow out of your quiver, and you load up your bow, and you pull back, and you fire at these guys as they're coming toward you. And by the way, I think in some ways that was my favorite game of them all. Um, because of just, just the action and the, and the scope of the place, there are little portals that you basically can fire arrows into the portals, which lets you teleport to a rock cliff or something like that. So you can get a better angle at the things that are coming toward you. And it all feels so incredibly realistic. You're standing on this rock, like this, this chunk of rock coming out of the ground, like, um, you know, like a, just a, a little butt coming out of the ground and you're and you're looking down and you're firing and you can walk right to the edge and it feels like you would fall off the edge if you walked a little bit further. You don't dare do it because it just looks so damn realistic. If if people now, are watching, and just real quick, if people are watching the video portion, we actually have uh, Quiver the trailer up on the video <laughs> screen. I mean, look, I mean, it... it I, I think when you say realism and people are thinking, wow, this must be hyper realistic, it's kind of cartoonish. It's kind of a video game, but it is. It is, except yeah. that you feel like you're in there. Right. Okay. So it isn't like it isn't something that you're watching on television. You actually feel like you're the character pulling the arrows out of the quiver and firing. Now here's the cool thing. You can actually feel the tension on the arrows as you pull back. Mm. Okay which is also really freaky. So afterwards, I asked the guy, I said, that is just so bizarre. I mean, I could feel the tension on the bow. How the hell do you do that? Okay. Right. And his answer sort of floored me. He said, we don't. You do. Because <laughs> you expect That's a, cop out. a bow to have tension when you pull back on the arrow. Okay. And then you let go of the arrow. So you feel, you expect to feel that, so you do. Mm. And when I was doing the fist bump with my son, I expected that there would be a feeling when we hit. And so your brain fills in some of the details because everything else about it is so hyper, you know, I'm in there, you know, the whole first person perspective. Remember, you, you don't see the room around you. All you see around you is what the game generates for you. You've right. got headphones on, so all you hear is what the game gives you. All you see is what the game gives you. Um, and of course, your hands, the movement of your hands, because you're holding the controllers in your hands, you know, move with your motion. So ev everything feels as though it should be doing what you think it should be doing. So it's like, it's awesome though, so, dude. Uh, I mean, but, if but, done, you must do this. Right, but I mean, that is, uh, I, I think a great way to wrap this up is, the question I think a lot of people have is, you know, you mentioned this is a VR arcade. Um, mm -hmm. I think many people have been to arcades around the country, around the world even, and only a small fraction of people actually have, you know, an arcade cabinet in their home. Do you think, you know, VR is something that could make it into the home after trying it, after experiencing it? Do you think this has mass appeal to make it into, or or do you think the arcade is the best setting for it? You know, I the the arcade was the best setting for video games. You know, twenty years ago or twenty five years ago, because the uh, the the you know you needed the big giant boxes and the, you know and the big things there to to actually be able to allow you to play these things. And then this thing shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. I actually think that yes, there are people who are going to put this in their houses, and it's going to be awesome, and it's going to be cool. But you know what I think is is happening more than anything else, and I, and I, I truly believe that this is where we're going. I think augmented reality is where all this is going to happen, and I know that Microsoft is doing this with their. Uh, I mean, they're working on this with their version of VR. Hello, but, but right? I'll, what's that? Sorry. Uh, uh, HoloLens, right? That's right, HoloLens. I, I, I think that this is where we are truly going to go, where you superimpose reality. I think there's going to be two variations of it. First of all, the headsets are going to become smaller and lighter, okay? And and there's going to be more power in them. The problem with Vive at the moment is you've got all these cables hanging from you, you know, pulling back to, to you know, the thing that's that's powering it all up. And at mm -hmm. the moment, that makes it a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit difficult for home use. I know that some of that stuff is shrinking, like the PSVR stuff, like, you know, the PS4 VR stuff 
you know, they've managed to shrink down the headset a bit and the cables aren't quite as, as cumbersome. According, and, and, and I mean, uh, according to, uh, to HTC, I think, or it was like, you know, one of the big players, uh, they're hoping that the next generation, not this generation, they're hoping to get it down to a single HDMI cable. They're hoping. Yeah, and they're going to do that. And at some point, they're going to get it down to a wireless cable. Right. <laughs> get eventually. that wireless cable. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but you're right. Eventually, eventually uh, wireless is uh, the hope and the dream of these people. Well, it's not just a hope and the dream. It's it's going to happen, and uh, and when they do when they do manage to uh, to fine tune the technology to the point where there isn't a cable hanging from you, um, I, I think it's truly going going to enter the home at that point. Honestly, when I was sitting there doing this thing, when I was when I was sitting inside, you know that that the VR game, I came home and I talked to my wife about this for like you know. I, an hour, I swear. And I must have talked about it for days afterwards. I can, because of the in, the ultra, despite the fact that we're cartoon characters inside these games, think about this for a second. You know, despite that fact, it felt like I was there with my son right next to me doing all these things, okay? So I have no trouble imagining, for instance, having a meeting in VR. Like if you're working at a company somewhere, you know, and you're going to meet your counterpart who's on the other side of the world, right? Rather than, rather than, you know, trying to fly somebody to a different location, I have no trouble imagining that you would put on, um, you know, you might put on a VR headset or something like that, and they're in the room with you and you're meeting with them. Um, I have no trouble imagining this in an augmented reality setting where you slap on a pair of glasses you can still see your office okay or your conference room but there are now three people sitting in the seats across from you in the conference room because the augmented reality setup makes it possible for them to be sitting with you despite the fact that they're not actually there i i've i've seen that they, they actually have a game um i'm not quite recalling which game it is but they actually already have a game uh but it's strictly for you know, for socializing. It's strictly that you join it and it has like little chat rooms or little hangouts. Mm -hmm. They're set in like, you know, waterfall scenes and the desert and blah, blah, blah. But the entire game of it is you join random chat rooms and there's, you know, one person, three people there, up to four people. And you sit around a table in the middle of a pretty scenic place and you talk to each other. And That's it's stupidly popular. Oh, I you know, but I can I can totally understand why it's popular. I mean, it it, it may I I played with a um, I played with an Android uh, app that you put um, uh, that you put in your um, uh, in your uh, cardboard headset. You know, right. basically your 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 cardboard headset or your daydream VR headset or whatever. And I played with that. You remember last month I did a uh, I did a, I gave a talk at uh, MMRCon. Yes, you did. Yeah. Anyway, um, just before I gave the talk, I was I was playing with a bunch of VR apps, and I was not for the talk, but I was playing with VR apps just to see, you know, some of the things that were available, and um, and I ran across one which I thought was really quite fascinating, and it's a it's to help public speakers practice their talk in front of an audience. Okay. Mm. I mean, this is what it's for. And you can take your PowerPoint presentation and load it in the app. And there's like, there's a timer sitting in front of you, like at a TED conference or something like this. There's a timer sitting in front of you that's counting down so that you know how much time you've got. And there's a room full of people who are looking at you and moving around like a room full of people would typically sort of do. And so you've got this big audience sitting in front of you. You've got the headset on. It feels like you're standing on the stage. Okay. Talking to this room full of people. And, um, and I thought, what a cool concept! <laughs> yeah, no, and, and and you know, I think we'll uh, we'll leave VR right there. I mean, honestly, yeah. you talked your wife for an hour. We could talk an hour ourselves about VR. Oh, I know, I know. But uh, it, it was it was a nice little interlude. But uh, yeah, wh why don't we get into, of course, what we do here with uh, you know, with you, with cooking with Linux and Linux in general. Let's uh, just jump right into that. And by the way, everyone, uh, there's a reason that it says that you know he runs cooking with Linux, and that's. Well, as I understand it, it was a food magazine. He did like a computer thing or, or no, no, I'm sorry. It was a computer magazine and you always paired Linux with a wine. So as I just heard earlier, you have one picked out. What's, uh, what's today's flavor? All right. Well, let's, let's, let's go directly to that. Shall we? Uh, I'm actually drinking a Chilean wine. It's Cabernet Sauvignon 2015, uh, Calatera Reserva Ca uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. 
And um, it's a it's a red wine that's uh, it's it's billed as a medium bodied, but I think it actually leans more toward the full body, to be perfectly honest. Um, it's uh, it's got that, you know, that sort of leathery sort of feeling on the tongue that Cabernet Sauvignon sort of have. You know, you feel it at the side of your tongue, you know, when you drink it. Um, it's uh, it's it's a deep red. I mean, to look at it, it's like a, it's a it's a deep red wine. I'm looking at it in front of a. Uh, of a sunny window and I, and I can't see through the wine. So it's pretty deep stuff. Right. Um, and it's kind of cherry plum flavored. It's, it's a nice wine and it's, it's also very inexpensive. It's a Ch- Chilean wine here in Canada. that runs for like $10 a bottle, you know, which probably means it's like a buck, buck 50 in your stores. Uh- <laughs> right. I, and, and, you know, and just for fun, I actually uh, looked it up and you know, they, the reviews for this thing as much, you know, I really caring your reviews, but, you know, seeing other people's reviews as well, kind of aggregated, you know, uh, three stars and bronze awards. So, you know, whenever it does place in, in, you know, kind of, uh, you know, wine awards, three stars, bronze. I mean, like not the best wine, but people seem to be really like it, you know, it's, you know, uh, um, yeah. which you have to understand is in the, is in the wine world, typically speaking, my experience has been that, that three stars means it's good. It's a, it's a fine, you know, it's a good drinking wine. Um, right. If you're below three stars, then things are starting to get tough. But three stars is basically what people give it when they say, you know, it's a perfectly good everyday wine. It's a, it's a you know, it's a, it's a nice drinking wine. You can have it with meal. You can have it casually or whatever. Uh, by the time you get to a four star for most reviews, it's start, you're entering the territory of pretty exceptional. Five yeah. star is exceedingly, exceedingly rare. Like, I mean, it's like, I mean, rare. Yeah. <laughs> so I, three stars and above is usually pretty good no matter what anyway. So, yeah. And, and because of this, uh, the show will get more entertaining the longer it goes on. So this, <laughs> so this is going to be fun. Uh, great wine. And before we jump into uh, the oh. show notes, I have a clip here that I wanted to play. And I know, Marcel, you won't be able to hear it, but we're going to play the end of this. Hopefully we don't get stopped with a big fat, uh, you know, letter in the mail that says, hey, you owe us x you know billion gagillion dollars for playing a dr evil <laughs> clip but here we go everyone that is of course unless you pay me one billion gajillion fifillion yep and that's right you uh unless you pay us one billion gagillion shabbity do dollars so as I understand that, uh, again, if you check out the show notes, uh, Marcel says that you just don't get this at all if you don't play that clip. So, yeah, there you go. Why, 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 why was that so? Well, we central? we had a lot. I mean, we had this thing with ransomware, and uh, you remember, of course, the uh, the wanna cry ransomware yeah. issue. Uh, you know that that have sort of dominated the news for the past little while. Um, the they're like, I mean. Uh, Stories with with hacking and with ransomware are becoming increasingly common, and uh, and that's one of those things that's actually not going away anytime soon. Um, the ransomware thing, uh, there are multiple people, and of course, what you did play there was the Doctor Evil clip from uh, the Austin Powers movies. You know, yes. pay me one million dollars, and everybody laughs, and it's yeah. like one hundred gazillion dollars. Anyway, it's a running joke in the old Austin Powers movie, but. Uh, Dr. Evil demanding money for ransom. And that's what happens with ransomware. Your PC has some piece of software that gets installed on it. And uh, they encrypt the files on your PC. And they demand, you know, if you want to be able to access your files, they demand that you pay some amount of money, usually in bitcoins, to some uh, anonymous account somewhere to be able to get your PC to go back to working normally. And um, <clears throat> and this is a real problem. Uh, it's a real problem not just because... Um, you know, it, it, it's evil and wrong and, uh, and criminal, but it's also really bad because it affects infrastructure. And uh, one of the places that got hit really bad was the uh, National Health Service in Britain. Yeah. And, and so all of a sudden you've got uh, surgeries that can't be performed. Uh, you know, uh, patient records aren't available to the doctors. The, so the, 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 what they were doing. Right. The, the day it happened, as I recall, they were... There were clinics across the country, of course, in the UK, that were turning people away you know, that needed care. And they're like, sorry, but uh, we don't have appointments. We don't have records. We don't have anything. They were turning people away and sending sending them, you know, across town, across, you know, crazy distances. 
Oh, yeah. And it wasn't I mean, and there were lots of different places that got hit with this. But of course, the the, the fact that you had that you had, you know, life saving services that were impacted, you know, makes it particularly bad at that point. You know, I'm not saying that it's bad, that it's not bad when a company gets hit and they're losing, you know, you know, however many millions of dollars per day. But if somebody can't have their life saving surgery because of this, then, you know, we've crossed a line, which is really particularly bad. Now, there, there, there are a lot of people to blame on this. I mean, you could sit there and you can blame the people who say, you know, well, you know, you should be updating your PCs. I could make jokes about the idea that, uh, you know, people should be running a Linux desktop and they're, you know, they're less likely to be, you know, to be uh, to fall prey to these sorts of things, because typically it infects, you know, um, Windows PCs. Right. Um, but as we know, the NSA, you know, the United States <laughs> NSA was was the source of this particular type of ransomware, the WannaCry ransomware. It was a vulnerability that they were keeping back in the hope of using it against a foreign target somewhere. And it attacked older versions of Microsoft Windows. Now, Microsoft, you know, you know, was pointing their fingers at the NSA and the NSA are pointing their fingers back at Microsoft. And everybody's pointing their fingers at, you know, this hacker group, whoever the hell they are, because nobody actually knows who they are for sure. Um, and, um, so there's a lot of blame to go around, but the blame on Microsoft side is the fact that it's an old version of windows that is no longer supported. Now, eventually Microsoft rece- released a patch. I mean, them. and, and just to be clear, when you say old, you mean windows XP old, which I, and I know, uh, we can make all the jokes about, oh, windows XP that just came out. Oh, it, it came out 17 years ago. Right. Crazy and old. lots and lots of people and companies are still using it. Still, like right now, yeah. Yeah, and they're still using it because they've got an application that was built to run in that environment and they don't want to mess with it because, you know, they don't have the money to... I mean, upgrading isn't just a question of, hey, go out and buy a new PC and upgrade. Sometimes it means that you need to upgrade the software that runs on those PCs. And that's a little bit more complicated than just going out and buying a new PC. Right. No. So, so there are a lot of reasons why this is a bad thing. The NSA shouldn't have been holding on to these vulnerabilities. It's kind of sad to think that, you know, uh, U.S. You know, um, intelligence agencies uh, can just have software like this walk out of the office one day and then fall into the hands of, you know, nefarious uh, sources. And of course, it's a pain in the butt that there's a company out there that, you know, says, look, I'm not supporting this software past this point. And I have mixed feelings when it comes to this. On one hand, if you have a piece of software out there, okay, and you are no longer willing to support it, I concur that you should open it up to the world. I was just thinking that, yeah. Software that is abandoned should become open source. And I feel like there should be laws in place that say if you're no longer willing to support your customers, if you're no longer willing to help in the security issues that surround this piece of software. I'm not saying that opening is going to necessarily protect you, okay? Right. But opening the software means that other eyes can go in, other people can go in and fix the vulnerability, which happens, by the way, in the open source world all the time. That isn't to say that bugs don't get overlooked for years sometimes, it happens. But the point, is that somebody can go in, <clears throat> excuse me, somebody can go in and actually fix these vulnerabilities at, you know, when they become evident or when they become a problem. Not so in the closed source software world. Again, I'm not, I, I, I don't want to beat up on Microsoft too much from the perspective of, look, you know, you can only support, you know, you only want to support people for so long. I mean, we, we put out a piece of software, it was 17 years ago, you know, and you haven't upgraded. I mean, how long do we need to support this thing? Well, the answer somehow I feel is A, forever, or B, you know, until you decide to open it up and let people take security into their own hands or give them the opportunity of taking security into their own hands at that point. And, and I mean, that kind of did happen where the, you know, uh, this whole thing with uh, with the National Health Services over in the UK. Oh, and by the way, uh, Marcel just flew on by. We have like 30 seconds here, so we're going to, uh, you know, continue after the break here. But 
that's kind of what happened with the WannaCry ransomware was that a gentleman under the moniker MalwareTech, uh, that is his Twitter handle, he actually found the, you know, uh, you know, found the kill switch for the ransomware and, you know, kind of distributed it and said, hey, here's what I found. That's kind of the appeal of opening the software is, hey, you know, you have, you know, 5,000 caring individuals who can find these kinds of solutions. So, you know, it's uh, what you say makes a lot of sense. We'll come back to it and we'll talk about, you know, kind of what Linux can do for abandonware because abandonware is a big deal and more of the like. So the music means we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. More Computer America just after this. Everyone stay tuned. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. Welcome back to the Computer America Show, 31 minutes past the hour. And continuing on with Cookie with Linux, Marcel Gagné, Freethinker at Large. Welcome. And, uh, and everyone out there, if you're just joining us, welcome into the program. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in. And we are doing our all Linux show today, where we focus on Linux, Linux problems, and Linux, well, in this case, Linux solutions. So, Marcel, sorry I had to cut you off there. But, yeah, I, 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 I think what you were really getting at was that abandonware, it's, uh, it's one of those things that, you know, it's services like the NHS and services, you know, uh, corporations and, you know, these mega, mega, mega infrastructure who, you know, took millions tens of millions hundreds of millions millions of dollars to build up and create they have to deal with eventually you know abandonware and you're saying that maybe linux would have a solution in that case well i mean it, it or open source would have a solution you know it, it, actually actually you you're, you're you're closer to being correct there as you know i i tend to i tend to equate i mean when i talk about linux i'm also i'm also talking about open source open right. stand and hardware i'm all about open as you know um, and I, and I think that open is the answer more than, you know, more than it's the answer and the solution to so many of these problems. Um, it is possible. It is extremely possible. It happens all the time. It is possible for companies to make it, to run a good, successful and profitable business by producing open source software it happens all the time. There are billion dollar companies that are built on open source software. Um, you know, and I, We've covered this ground before. IBM, uh, you know, is a company that makes huge amounts of money on open source software. Google is built on open source software. Amazon is built on open source software. Right. It's possible, um, but yeah, I think that I think that the open philosophy, the uh, the open source idea, uh, needs to pervade businesses quite a bit more. And and again, I don't. I, I'm I'm not saying that that companies have to support their software forever. OK, but in the case of something like this, it becomes obvious that, look, if you can't if you can't or you're unwilling to support it, you know, I think there should be some principle in place, whether it's a legal principle. Uh, and in fact, it may have to be a legal principle that says, look, if you've abandoned the software, then you open it up to the world. And uh, I know that flies in the face of, of copyright and patents and so forth, but I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. We're getting to the point where, you know, these old ideas of protecting your stuff uh, can do huge amounts of damage to you know millions of people, to the world, to the economy. And you can't hide behind your patents and you can't hide behind your copyrights if you're not willing to take responsibility for the stuff that you produce. 
that is, of course, high-minded and, you know, free thinker at large. That, that is a large idea. But um, it, it, you're right. I mean, technology is built on its predecessors. It's, you know, it, it's a continuous evolution. But eventually, at you know, eventually what was maybe 10 years ago is no longer in use except by those that really, really, really need it. And Microsoft has made it very clear, especially with Windows 10. They have no interest, zero interest, mm -hmm. in keeping old operating systems uh, up and running. They are, you know, give you every urging to switch, but at the same time, you know, some people just can't do that. So, makes perfect sense. And of course, ransomware it will continue to be a problem. I'm sure we'll talk about it again another time. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, there you go, ransomware. It's uh, definitely something that needs to be, you know, taken more seriously and. Yeah, the open philosophy. So, all right. Uh, why don't we uh, Let's it, move on to our distribution focus, shall we? Exactly, because I don't think we've had one for for a little while now. Because uh, you know, well, you... Well, our distribution focus last time was Android, which uh, <laughs> which which was kind of interesting because right. you know Android is a is a is a Linux. Um, if you want to, you know, if you want to get technical, it is a Linux, but it does um, it it does. Uh, present itself in a different way, shall we say? Um, the distribution focus is Debian. Debian. I've heard uh, of them. Yeah, Debian is kind of it's like one of the old, old, ancient uh, distributions. You know, that's been around forever. Um, in fact, it is uh, 24 years uh, since Debian was first released. And Debian 9, Debian is often seen as a slow-moving distribution. Slow-moving because, of course. They're, they they try to build on the concept of of stability. You know, it's more important to have a stable, secure distribution than it is to have something that's bleeding edge. You know, and um, and writing the latest and greatest. So that tends to be a lot of the philosophy behind it. But Debian nine was just released, and um, it is uh, I'm I'm dedicating the distribution focus to them today. Um, it's also dedicated to its founder uh, Ian Murdoch, who died um, in December of 20, 2015. So uh, the distribution is dedicated to them as well at that point. So just thought I'd enter that one. But um, you can um, so the new version is available, and as with many of these things, it's um, there's an ISO a DVD that you can download. Um, which uh, you can get either through, you know, BitTorrent or whatever. Uh, makes me think of something else. Well, that. But anyway, um, so and and there are different versions for pretty much. I mean, a whole pile of different architectures. So practically, I mean, if you go there, you'll see that there are like tons and tons of different architectures that you can run this thing on. So. It's available, it's uh, it's downloadable, and it supports a whole pile of different desktops. Now, I downloaded a version that uses the Mate desktop. Right. And I think that uh, Mate is kind of the um, the child of the old GNOME, GNOME 2 desktop, uh, but, uh, you know, prettier and, and, and nicer than uh, the old GNOME 2. Uh, but I downloaded that one, and that's the one that I decided to run and play with. Um, there are... a couple of interesting things. One of them uh, is that um, obviously it's doing a lot of updated software. One of the things that they were doing for a while there, which was a little bit weird, is that they had a version of Firefox and Thunderbird included, which was called Ice Weasel and Ice... Ice... Uh -huh. I'm 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 drawing a blank. I'm drawing a mental blank here. Even I, even I, it was like ice weasel and like not ice fair, but it was like ice uh, marmot or something. <laughs> some, uh, some, yeah. some some ice uh, rodent something. Yeah, some ice rodent of some sort. But ice weasel was the version of Firefox, and it was due to some some you know licensing and uh, and philosophical issues that Debian was unwilling to get behind. And uh, and this distribution marks the return of the official Firefox and official Thunderbird to Debian. So it's it's one of the things that you know it may not mean much to a lot of people, but it's one of the things that has been included in there. Um, the basically, I mean, the software has been updated across the board to you know to look like most modern distributions. The one thing it doesn't have, which is uh, which almost which. I'm going to say almost pretty much every major distribution has today is support for secure boot. Okay. Um, so it's 
So if you're trying to install it on a PC that has secure boot, um, you're going to want to turn off secure boot to be able to install it. And that's, you know, that's, that's kind of a downer, um, but that's the thing that's kind of missing from this one. I, I mean, uh, just kind of go over real quick. I mean, who who do you really feel that this appeals to? Because you know, as as with most distributions that you bring on the show here, they they have kind of a a thrust. You know, someone who you know maybe this is full of uh, you know uh, security flaws and it's for security professionals to uh, you know to run different things on. Who do you think is really using you know this uh, this just distribution? Well, um, I, I'm going to say right off the bat that purists, uh, people who are, you know, free software purists are going to be um, people who who go to this distribution. Also, people who are running servers where stability is more important than, you know, the latest and greatest. What makes this attractive, of course, is it's about as close to latest and greatest as you ever get in a, in a Debian distribution because it's it's you know, it's, I think it's been two years since the last time they released one. Whereas, you know, a lot of distributions every six months, there's a new version that comes out. Whereas, you know, these guys, it's like, it's been two years right. and now they're finally one. Um, they have, uh, they have a KDE version, but even their KDE version, um, you know, the KDE version, the cinnamon desktop, all this stuff is actually, you know, a little back of what you find in other distributions. So who is it for? It's for anybody who, who wants a desktop, which is, you know, closer to free. And I mean, philosophically free, not just free, you know, I don't pay money for this, but uh, free and open. So somebody for whom free and open is important is, is going to be, uh, is going to be drawn toward uh, Debian. And of course, anybody who's more in interested in, um, in the stability aspect of it is going to be more drawn to it. It's not necessarily a distribution that's going to be really hugely popular with, uh, you know, people who, who want access to all, you know, to all the latest and greatest, whether it's games or whether it's desktops. If you want to ride the bleeding edge, you're probably not going to be looking at Debian. Right. Okay. That, that makes sense. And especially for a, uh, for a company whose logo is, uh, is that of a snail spiral. So it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, <laughs> Not a snail spiral. That's not what it is. <laughs> uh, probably not. But <laughs> but but no. It's uh. So Debian. You know, there's something to be said about Sable, and you know, just kind of poking around their site, they have a lot of uh. You know, the the frequent the frequently asked questions. Um. You know, they they really do kind of uh. They they are the epitome of what you talk about when it comes to free. I mean, you know, they they really do hammer you over the head with, well. You know, what do you mean by free? You know, it doesn't cost someone time, money. And they, they do a pretty good job of explaining that people do this. Um, yeah. Like yeah. I said, they, they embody, you know, in many ways, they embody the open philosophy. If, you know, uh, as opposed to, you know, open, I can get stuff for free, which, you know, which, you know, open is a multi splendored word, as you know. Um, but Debian, the other thing that needs to be understood is Debian is kind of the heart and soul of a lot of popular distributions that exist out there, including Ubuntu, for instance, uh, the apt packet package manager, which is included in, uh, in Ubuntu, uh, you know, takes, you know, its roots are in, in Debian, you know, in the Debian distribution. So, so it's not just the you know the open philosophy that's embodied there it's also the fact that it's it's kind of the precursor to a lot of you know what people who are desktop centric in a big way uh think of as linux you know so right so there you okay. go there you go there is our uh distribution focus so debian and yeah and of course very nice that they were able to dedicate it to you know to one of its founders or at least the founder of debian uh of course, in true Debian fashion, uh, a couple years after the fact, but still nice gesture all around. So very, very cool. And, you know, admittedly, not as, uh, not as, uh, kind of pinpointed as, you know, let's say your anime one or you know, <laughs> not, not, not as quirky as your security one, but, uh, but still, you know, very, very cool to highlight. Well, you know, every once in a while, I have to be a little bit serious. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, but now getting back into the less serious territory, we have yes. text-based games, and this may, you know, I, and and like, it's it's weird because 
video, like not even video games, but just games in general, tabletop is making such a large resurgence in the field. And you have Dungeons and Dragons, you know, imagine, imagination based games are more popular than ever right now. So maybe there's room for text based games to also make a comeback. You know, <sighs> I, the, the term comeback is weird to me because, uh, you know, they've always been there. OK, it's not like it's not like they disappeared at any point. It feels like a comeback because there are people who are taking note of it or paying attention who haven't paid attention before. There's a there's a restaurant slash bar around here, which is all about games. You go in and they have like box games lining the walls and you go in and you take a game from the wall and you sit down and have a drink and, you know, and, you know, buy your wine or your beer or whatever. And you have and you play a game with people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, you know, that's, that's kind of cool. So I, I can, I can appreciate what you're saying there, but I thought I, I was actually thinking about uh, the fact that I've actually been playing a few text games lately, which seems odd to me because, and, and I've been doing this, I, I don't know what made me do it or why I suddenly started. This was like a cool thing to do, but I started playing these text games that I haven't played for a long time. And the first one that I ran into um, or that I went after was one just called plain. It's, I mean, it's called adventure. And it's the old colossal cave one. You know, you're sitting in a, you know, you're sitting inside this cave. There's a passage that runs to the east and west. You know, you hear a sound. There's a description of what's happening around you. And people who, uh, you know, who came from the uh, DOS slash Windows world may remember the Zork games of old. You know, yeah. uh, they were inspired by the original text adventure game. So, so like I said, I started playing some of these and uh, I thought that, you know, I, I, toss in some text-based games, despite the fact that I have fought long and hard to convince people that, you know, Linux is modern and graphical and shiny. <laughs> you know? And now I'm going to suggest, uh, you know, text-based games to show, just to show what you can do. If, 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 if nothing else, you are showing the flexibility of the operating system. Well, the flexibility of what you can do with just text. That's you it. Know, or, or just lines. It's really cool. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with, uh, I'm going to start with a Pac-Man clone. Okay, I'm gonna go back to adventure in a minute because I want to go back to adventure. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna start with a Pac-Man clone. This is something called Pac-Man for console. C O N S P A C M A N four, as in the number C O N S O L E, and it's a um, it's it's an implementation of Pac-Man inside uh, a terminal window, and um, it draws out the screen very nicely. The ghosts are ampersand signs of different colors, and Pac-Man is a capital C that wanders around. The, uh, the fruit are little asterisks which show up in different parts of the board. And you move around this thing using your cursor keys, and um, it, it works. <laughs> I mean, yes. I mean and, and and I I actually found it you know I must be a genius actually I know I am because I actually found a a video of someone playing the game. Woohoo! Um, yeah, and it, it I mean it's it's Pac-Man to a T. They have everything from even the ghosts turn into, you know, glowing ghosts when you eat well, in this case an asterisk instead of, you know, the, the large dots. But uh someone spent a lot of time on this. It's 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 really kind of cool, actually. Uh, you've you've since you said that you found a video of it. Uh, I think I think that's what I will dedicate my next cooking with Linux video to. Just text games. So I'll actually play some text <laughs> games. There you just, go. Not just one, but I'll play several text games inside uh, a terminal window just to show what it's like. Anyway, so so Pac Man is one of them. Um, I, I'm also going to mention one called. Um, this is going to be a big generic, and I know I'm going outside of the list that I gave you here a little bit. Or order BSD games. There's a package that you can install on your Linux distribution called BSD games, and um, and it's available pretty much. I think it's available on most distributions. Uh, like if you want, you can you know app get install or apt install BSD games. B S D G A M E S, and it is a whole bunch of of simple adventure games, including uh, sorry simple text games, including the old fortune cookie game, for instance. Uh, things like Hunt the Wumpus. And, uh, you know, things that have been, um, if you'll pardon the expression, long ago forgotten, but, uh, <laughs> but are, they, they have, they have, but they're nonetheless, um, you know, really quite a lot of fun to play with. 
Um, so BSD Games is one of the packages. And in BSD Games, you will find things like the old original um, adventure game. There's a game called Hunt. There's a, ga- there's a Monopoly, a text game version of Monopoly, Hangman. You know, um, which draws out, literally draws out the little hangman characters. Let's see, so, some of these. Uh, you also have Tetris, Snake. I mean, Tetris. You know, right. Tetris. There's, uh, you know, and some of, some of the games you're going to recognize. What's, what's interesting about it is they predate the graphical versions that we've learned to play. So some of these games existed before the graphical versions. Um, Meal Born, the card game, is is available, uh, you know, in this package. Uh, there's a worm game, which is like the old centipede game. That if if you remember the old arcade, the centipede game. Uh, there's a game called Worm. All this stuff is uh, Snake, uh, which is a, which is a variation on the same sort of thing. Um, I'm trying to remember, Snake is the one that's like centipede, or a worm is the one. But we're, or a worm is the one where there's another worm and you eat, and eventually you wind up eating your own tail, that sort of thing. Um, there's a Tetris. There's a text version of Tetric, Tetris. Tetris. Right. <laughs> Help me out here, Ben. Tetris. Tetris. Absolutely. I, I, and and, and I, I mean, like, all of these, though, I, I, I'm... Because obviously I was born, you know, these games are as old as I am when I was born. Um, you know, in, in some cases. I mean, I, I'm having a hard time kind of... Like, are, are these entertaining after the fact? Like, are you having... Are you having some kind of fun, you know, playing these, or is it all nostalgia? You know, it's not all just nostalgia. I know it sounds crazy, but but it's not just it, nostalgia. It's it, it it really is crazy. Like, there's no other word to put to it. You just went to a virtual reality arcade <laughs> where you got put into a new reality, and here you are saying, you know, but these text-based games, they're pretty good on their own. They are. They. Are. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. It, it actually is true. Um. And I'm now, you know, when you put it that way, it's hard for me to explain <laughs> this. <laughs> it's hard for me to explain this, but it's it's true. They they can well, be it, 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 it it's not that hard to explain it because really what they both do, and I mean you did this yourself with the virtual reality arcade. Um, you know, just like with the tension of the bowstring and just like the, the fist bump, your brain said it was one thing and it made the it made the connection for you. It was imagination. Text based does the exact same thing. If you have a good imagination, if you're good at filling in the gaps yourself, text does the exact same thing as virtual reality. It gives your brain enough, and then your brain fills in the rest. I think it's really the same principle. Yeah, no, um, you you are absolutely correct. Thank you for being so wise beyond you <laughs> here. No problem. It's what I do. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so and of course, in BSD games, as I mentioned, is Colossal Cave, also known as just plain old adventure. Okay, and and let me just uh, let me just uh, paint a picture for you. Somewhere nearby is Colossal Cave, where others have found fortunes and treasure and gold, though it is rumored that some who enter are never seen again. Magic is set to work in the cave. I will be your eyes and hands. Direct me with commands of one or two words. I should warn you that I only look at the first five letters of each word, so you'll have to enter northeast as N-E to distinguish it from north. Should you get stuck, you know, and on and on it goes. It's just... Right. Just straight text, and it starts out with, you're standing at the end of a road before a small brick building. Around you is a forest. A small stream flows out of the building and down a gully. And that's where it starts. And yeah. that's, that's how you play it. Now, a little bit more intense than this is a game that has been around for, oh, I have no idea. It has been around for forever. It's called NetHack. Okay, N-E-T-H-A-C-K. NetHack is, is, is kind of the, I, I hate using the word original. It's a dungeon crawler, okay, uh, where you are sitting inside a dungeon and, uh, and there are all sorts of things that you need to do. Like, just to give you an idea, um, NetHack was originally called just Hack. And people have been working on this game for decades. And I mean, literally decades. And, you know, and continue to work on variations of this thing. And it is so intense. And there is so much information on this. And the whole thing is with keyboard commands. Like you can use, a, you use a keyboard keys to move. Like K moves up, J moves down, H moves to the left, L moves to the right. Uh, there are symbols. I mean, it's, it, like I said, there is a huge amount of stuff. You, there 
are fighting, you fight with one letter W to wield a weapon, X to change your weapon. You pay for things by typing P. Uh, you can pick up objects and drop objects, like D to drop an object. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just, it, it sounds crazy, but there are so many things. You can cast a spell with a capital letter F. You can teleport. Uh, you know, with control T, all of this is done from the keyboard and it is incredibly, incredibly rich as a land, you know, as a landscape. Uh, it's been ported to like countless different platforms and, um, and it's strangely not remotely boring. The, the idea goes something like this. You're in an underground cavern called the Mazes of Menace or the Dungeons of Doom, depending on the virgins, or the virgins, <laughs> the version that you're playing. <laughs> And right. in there is the fabled amulet of Yendor. And the person who finds the amulet, to the person who finds this amulet, there are untold riches and the gifts of immortality bestowed by the gods. And to find this amulet, you have to travel through dungeons and mazes. You encounter puzzles, strange objects, pits from which there's no escape, demons, goblins, grid bugs, and other monsters. And then, of course, you have to deal with hunger and thirst. And you are assigned a character, or you can create your own character. You could be a barbarian, a monk, a knight, a wizard, a tourist, uh, a priest or priestess. You can be a human or, or an elf. You can be male or female. And at your side is like a, a little animal, you know, your little dog, which follows you around. And uh, you have to be careful not to kill your dog because your dog or your pet can help you out by helping you fight monsters as you go along. So mm -hmm. it's... I, I, I and, and you know I, I I've just been checking out the the Wikipedia page, which is pretty threadbare, but at the same time pretty thing like they still it's threadbare? host seriously. Yes. They're, they're, somebody has to fix this. Yeah, but 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 I mean the, the, they do have some quotes, but they uh they still have ongoing net hack tournaments like yearly, right? This I'm, no, I'm serious. There are people who play this game today. Yeah, yeah, okay? I, th that's what I'm saying. And they say it have been ported all over the place. I mean. Uh, you know, we're running low on time, so let me just give you a few quotes oh, for right. people out there who wanted to be sold more on NetHack. Uh, they have Will Wheaton. Yes, that Will Wheaton <laughs> said that uh, NetHack is one of my all-time favorite games, one I've been playing since my 1200 baud was smoking fast. That's one of his. And then Anonymous Usenet Poster said, thank you for the latest release of Grade Wrecker. My GPA just went into the corner and shot itself. So, I mean, you know, people, I guess, really, really, really enjoy NetHack. And I've never even heard of it. Seriously? I have oh, not. It, I have not. It's awesome. Like, I, I okay, it, it's hard for me to, it's hard for me just to, to explain just how much you can get out of a simple text game. But this thing, like, you get kind of wrapped up inside this thing. I've been playing this, like, for 25 years. <laughs> You know, and I still play it. I, you know, um, not have, every day. Obviously. Have you ever? Have you ever ascended? Have I ever? No. <laughs> <laughs> I always what? die somewhere along the way. It's one of those games that I, I I don't play it with a seriousness that would that it would that would allow me to get to those. You know, to to get the amulet, for instance. But um, somewhere along the way, I always wind up getting killed. But it's but it's fun. It's just one of those things that for some reason you can always fire it up from a terminal window. Uh, there is also, believe it or not, there are graphical versions of NetHack if you want to play the graphical versions. Uh, but I don't, I've played the graphical versions and I'm more likely and I will occasionally, like I said, still fire up the text-based version. And yet I never fire up the graphical version ever, mm. like ever, despite the fact that a graphical version of this exists I never play it. I play the text version. To this day, I still occasionally play the. I just fire it up, just you know, to play for a few minutes to kill some time. You because it's this. You it's heard this it here yeah. first, everyone. You heard it here first. Marcel Gagné is a purist. That's right. We've labeled him. He is a purist. So <laughs> it makes perfect sense. So Marcel, but uh, you know, we are just out of time. I mean, this really has flown by. And everyone out there, if you want to check out anything that we talked about, including uh, links, and we're going to talk about real quick about what Marcel's doing. But if you want to check any of this out, show notes, computeramerica.com, everything right there. So, Marcel, what, uh, what are you up to lately? 
Um, what am I up to? Uh, oh, good grief. I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I mean, I try, I keep doing videos on YouTube. I'm doing uh, game videos. Like I said, I do game videos as well as the cooking with Linux videos. I still run my consulting business. Um, I am, uh, I'm, I'm working on an, uh, I'm working on a novel. I'm writing a science fiction young adult novel. Hmm. Um, yeah. Um, and, uh, I believe it or not, uh, I'm playing with a podcast. Oh, dude. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so you, you, the... you are now the enemy. That is awesome. So, <laughs> I, I, please, you, you know, uh, when you have more to share, please do. And that sounds uh, that sounds really awesome. So, everyone yeah, out there, by yeah. the next, hopefully by the next show, I can tell you a little bit more about that. Perfect. Yeah, can't can't wait. Can't wait. So, everyone out there, Marcel Gagné, again, free thinker at large, and yeah, we have links to all of this and more over in the show notes. So, until next time, Marcel, we we'll see you next month, third. Uh, no, second thursday or third thursday of every month it's one of those and yeah uh it's gonna be a lot of fun so marcel thank you so much all right you take care all right have a good one bye-bye and everyone else out there thank you for joining us here on the program hopefully you had fun tune in tomorrow as we have on the show oh someone i don't know but it'll be fun join us have a good one bye everyone <laughs>